这一定能够取得伟大的胜利。要本次出主的工作报告，等怎么办呢？我们要按他的最高指示办。They were looking for some entry into the modern world, and nothing in their ancient culture could give them any guide to the turbulence they found. It was a quest, a 50-year search for some new kind of government, some new form of order. We don't know our unconscious personality. We have hints, we have certain ideas, but we don't know it real. Nobody can say their hand hints to the unconscious. Of man can reach for those ways. Fathers and sons traditionally have close ties, but now you had to end your relationship. Little, it was really sad. You just had to do it. Это один из важных периодов в истории коммунистической партии Советского Союза, в истории борьбы за укрепление могущества нашей родины, за построение коммунистического общества, за мир во всем мире. In our world, there will be no emotions except fear. Rage, triumph, and self-abasement. But always there will be the intoxication of power. Always, at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. In 1911, China's imperial legacy, going back 5,000 years, officially ended with the stepping down of the last Chinese emperor, known as the Son of Heaven, and by extension of the translation, the Son of God. The ending of 5,000 years of imperial tradition will one day be recorded as the most impactful event to ever occur in Chinese history. The gradual death of the cult of the emperor during the 19th century completely eviscerated Confucian tradition which maintained China's well-balanced social hierarchies as well as traditional values. All human relationships and social hierarchies were colored with the lens of Confucian values, dictating how children should be with their parents, how wives should be with their husbands, and how subordinates should be with their superiors. It was the way by which leaders ruled, how laws were made and how punishment was administered. Confucianism was a tree and root of society that had kept it a functioning entity for thousands of years. Even Taoism and Buddhism would suffer similar fates. With the loss of their most prized institution, China was left with a wide gaping hole in the structure of their society, a vacuum that was begging to be filled with something to keep their ship from sinking into disarray and eventual annihilation, no different to the pre-Columbian civilizations of the Americas. China's first brave foray into the new paradigm it found itself in as a country was based on the model laid out for it by Western European nations and their successful offspring in Japan and America. The industrialized democracies of the world were a framework for China to craft its new identity upon and so hope to mimic the success of Japan, who had also been through a painful rebirthing process. Despite the best efforts of the nationalists, the hole that was left by imperial China was larger than life to fill, and the nation remained as divided as ever. Most of China didn't fully accept the nationalists and became beholden to warlord rule instead. Furthermore, they inherited the economic strife that had beset the failed Qing dynasty as well, as well as the dire geopolitical situation that had every imperial nation of the 19th century biting at China's heels. Most importantly, China was still without an overarching narrative, a sense of destiny, a sense of place within the new world it found itself in. Sun Yat-sen and the Nationalists had done much to bring the love of the emperor to love of the country, but such cultural shifts take time and unfortunately for the Nationalists, they were in borrowed time since day one. The tragedies of the first half of the 20th century battle-tested the resolve of the Nationalists who would be forced to compete with a rival narrative about China's destiny, a destiny of communist rule. Compared to the communists, the nationalists didn't have one-size-fits-all grand narratives like the communists who had the answers for everything, why the economy was bad, why the nation was weak, why the peasants were poor and illiterate, why the country was being colonized by imperialists. In the battle over hearts and minds, the communists gave what the hundreds of millions of the underclass really wanted, an answer to everything. But they couldn't receive such messages from anyone. They needed a warrior, a philosopher, an emperor, all rolled into one. Chiang Kai-shek had some admirable qualities, but there was just something about Mao Zedong's larger-than-life persona that just seemed to perfectly fit the wide gaping hole that had been left in Imperial China's wake.
Every dynasty and every period in China's history has added a new hero to the pantheon of semi-divine beings that were revered for centuries, and Mao Zedong was that kind of man. It's clear that without Mao, there would be no Communist Party, for he represented something much bigger than the foreign political system that is known as Communism. When the Communists took power in 1949, Mao had solidified his place as the semi-divine patriarch of the nation, and it's well agreed upon that this is the date when the century of humiliation was officially considered to have ended. When the Communists took power, they seemingly reigned supreme and the tables had turned greatly in China's favour. Unlike the time when they'd been humiliated during the aftermath of World War I, China had earned a prized seat at the victor's table with the big boys of World War II. Their Japanese aggressors lay in ruins ruled by a foreign occupier. Their once formidable Kuomintang rivals were now country bumpkins on the island of Taiwan, and their puppet North Korea loomed large over the Korean peninsula. All of the imperial powers who had carved up China like a Christmas turkey were now devastated and now, only second to America, China had become the master of Asia. So what the heck happened? China's model for success was the Soviet Union, who is considered a successful socialist state by Chinese standards. Not being fully aware of the much covered up Holodomor event where tens of millions of Ukrainians died as a result of collectivized farming practices, Mao sought to replicate their Soviet farming model to boost agricultural production whilst at the same time using the model to kickstart China's industrialization as a steel exporting powerhouse. This economic program, ran entirely by ideology, was known as the Great Leap Forward in 1958, an ambitious plan to race from socialism to the communist utopia envisioned by Marx over a century ago. Townships across the country were converted into entities known as communes, an idealistic living space where families are made to live with townsfolk who eat, live and work in the same communal facilities. Besides pooling together their agricultural efforts, People were also made to smelt steel in what were known as backyard furnaces. Owing to a wave of persecutions known as the anti riders campaign that took place at the same time as the Great Leap Forward, most commune leaders were terrified of not meeting their quotas and frequently resorted to lying about their production output, hoping to kick the can down the road just a little longer, but as the state came to collect these non-existent surpluses, peasants were left to starve. The steel production was a cruel joke as well. To meet the unrealistic quotas, peasants and commune leaders cannibalized every metallic object in their town down to the nails in their roofs and their own farming equipment. The backyard furnaces were not hot enough to purify the stuff, leaving them with less than low quality steel unworthy for export or use. In perhaps the most infamous example of the law of unintended consequences at work, Mao implemented the Four Pests campaign. Aimed at improving the quality of life of people out in the communes, people were responsible for killing mosquitoes who spread malaria, killing rodents who spread plagues, flies which spoil the food, and sparrows which eat the grain of the field. Millions of people across China banged noisy pots and pans throughout the countryside day and night with the goal of preventing the sparrows from returning back to their nests to rest, causing them to drop out of the sky dead from exhaustion. As a result, the locust population ballooned without their natural predators and exacerbated the famine that up till now is unparalleled in history. All told, the race to a communist utopia led to 55 million dead. This extraordinary image that comes from a report by a local carder in a county in Sichuan province where he finds out that um, Local, locally in the county, about a quarter of a million of kilos of mud have been dug up and eaten. So he wants to find out what happens. He goes down to the village. He sees a pit with villagers naked, sweating under the glare of the sun, shriveled bodies queuing up in order to go down the pit and grab a handful of the white porcelain colored mud referred to as guanyin soil. It's a vision of hell. It's a vision of hell. And once you know what happens when people ingest uh, mud, once the moisture is taken out, it acts like concrete. People that die of pain, excruciating pain. Despite the total ignorance of the people in identifying the true culprit of their suffering, the situation was entirely clear to the Communist Party members who were closer to the source of decision making and the consensus was clear. 
Mao was a dangerous idiot, and despite the dangers to their lives, many officials in high positions of power openly voiced their opposition to Mao, key of which was Field Marshal Peng Dehuai, a key figure in China's revolution and considered Mao's right-hand man at the time. Throughout the 50s, Peng Dehuai resisted the establishment of Mao's cult, but the beginning of the Great Leap Forward in 1958 was the last straw for him. After a tense power struggle, Mao came out on top and Peng Dehuai was purged as a result. What may appear as business as usual for Mao was anything but. Peng Dehuai's open confrontation with Mao haunted him till his death and left him with a fatalistic sense of impending doom about his fate. Not the fate of his life, but the fate of his legacy. How was Mao going to be remembered? Mao had solidified his place amongst the pantheon of revolutionary leaders along with Lenin and Stalin, his two great heroes, but it had become apparent to Mao that the Soviet Communist Party had become corrupted to the core and was made up of what he called revisionists. A revisionist was someone of socialist leanings who had gone soft and started to see history differently to the socialist world's status quo. Case in point, according to their false, revised history, Stalin was a brutal tyrant as opposed to a sagacious liberator. Even despite Stalin's immense cult of personality and his stature as the face of international communism, none of that was enough to shield him from the ignorant revisionist within his own party who would attack him once he lay defenseless in his grave. Khrushchev, a name that will live in infamy forever in Mao's mind. This Nikita Khrushchev, the first secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The successor to Stalin had shocked the world in 1956 with the release of the famous secret speech. With threat of persecution finally at an end, Khrushchev lambasted Stalin's rule during a closed session of Congress. Khrushchev plainly stated the truth that everyone had seen with their own eyes but were too afraid to say or do anything about. Stalin was a brutal tyrant that persecuted even innocent people, and Khrushchev's role as the leader of the Soviet Union would be the rolling back of many of the Stalin-era policies and what became known as de-Stalinization. The Gulag started to release prisoners, the persecution slowed down, and many books were unbanned. Mao was forced to watch in horror as Khrushchev destroyed Stalin's entire legacy by dismantling his cult of personality and liberalizing the culture. It's almost as if Khrushchev was posing as a real socialist for decades and now that he had his shot of power, he reveals himself to be nothing but a capitalist lapdog for America, according to Mao. But it's not just Khrushchev, it was all the people in the Soviet Union Communist Party. They had gone soft and the old guard of real communism People like Stalin and Mao were a dying breed. These revisionists had taken the progress of the communist utopia that Mao and Stalin had painstakingly built and had flung it back into a capitalist direction. These revisionists had wormed their way into the highest rungs of power and whether they were aware of it or not, they were capitalists in disguise or as Mao had called them, capitalist rotors, a term used to describe someone who is socialist on the outside for appearance's sake but was secretly a capitalist oppressor. For Mao, only a true Marxist can uncover the hidden feelings of oppressive capitalists disguised as socialist, and Khrushchev was one of them. Why else would he be liberalizing the country unless he was secretly a capitalist? He was clearly a capitalist in disguise. Worldwide communism was thrown into disarray following Khrushchev's secret speech. There was unrest in Poland, a revolution in Hungary, riots in Georgia, and 30,000 American Communist Party members ended their membership within a week. Mao took decisive leadership and aimed to become the symbolic leader of international communism in Stalin's stead by establishing a competing narrative in opposition to Khrushchev. Mao would do his best to uphold an untarnished image of Stalin and would continue to promote his cult. Khrushchev was clearly a madman to Mao and it would only be a matter of time before every inch of Siberia would be covered in McDonald's franchises. In his public report, Khrushchev revised Leninist doctrine in two ways. He proclaimed that the war between communism and imperialism was not fatally inevitable, and he saw the possibility of peaceful rather than revolutionary transition to enable communism to take place. This was tantamount to betrayal for Mao, and Stalin, who he probably imagined spinning in his grave like a turbine. The feeling of animosity was starting to become mutual though. In 1958, China and the nationalists were at it once again. The Chinese had invaded the nationalist-controlled island of Kinmen, hoping that the Americans wouldn't come to the aid of their beleaguered Taiwanese allies in an attempt to strain their relationship. 
On the contrary though, not only did America show up in full force, the Soviets had told Mao to back off. For the Soviets, Mao was acting recklessly at bringing fights to the Soviets that they didn't want, while Mao was disappointed that the Soviets didn't show enough support. As if there was any more proof that the Soviet Union had gone all soft and cuddly with the capitalists, Khrushchev denied giving the A-bomb to China and later on had signed a joint declaration with America and the UK on an end to nuclear bomb testing, shutting China out from joining the League of Atomic Nations. Khrushchev's humiliation of Mao seemed to have no end. Khrushchev attended the 10th anniversary of the Communist Revolution in China, arriving directly from America after a meeting with Eisenhower, calling him a man of peace. This was just like rubbing a McDonald's cheeseburger in Mao's face. In Mao's darkening vision, the 1950s Chinese slogan of the Soviet Union today is our tomorrow became an increasingly foreboding fortune for him. When a group of African rebels from Rhodesia came to see Chairman Mao in the summer of 1963, a strong square-shouldered rebel said to Mao that the red star that used to shine over the Kremlin had slipped away and that the Soviet Union is now selling weapons to their imperialist enemies when they once used to support the revolutionary cause. He asked Chairman Mao if the red star in Tiananmen would fade away as well. Mao understood perfectly. The Soviet Union had betrayed the revolution. The rebel asked Mao, can you guarantee you won't go down the same road? Khrushchev, that revisionist, that destroyer of the spirit of socialism. Mao was certain how this pretender had come to propagate his oppressive capitalist ways and it was through culture. Capitalist culture had been so ingrained into people that even when they became communist, they naturally revert back to their original capitalist conditioning for some reason. Mao had seen this within his own party as well. After the Great Leap Forward, the revisionists within his own party, people like Peng De Huai, shunned the collective policies of communal farming and production when things hadn't gone according to plan. And it was at this time when hundreds, then thousands of Communist Party members started to show their true capitalist colors by liberalizing the communes. In truth though, these dissenters had pulled out the stops to save the country from the disastrous Great Leap Forward campaign that Mao was responsible for. But Mao saw this heroic act to spare the nation from total annihilation by famine as an act of revisionism that diluted and perverted the revolutionary cause of socialism. This was a surer sign than any that ultimately betrayed their secret love for capitalism. For Mao, Allowing people to trade was capitalist. Allowing people to farm their own lands was capitalist. Discontinuing the political persecution against rightist was capitalist. Time was against Mao. When one capitalist rode up would reveal himself within his party, three more would appear. In Peng De Huai's dead was Liu Xiaoqi, Zhou Enlai, and Deng Xiaoping. In the truest sense, their leadership was more akin to that of a quiet operator, silently working behind the scenes to keep the country functional and running. Unlike the privilege that Mao had, being the nation's ideologue, they were the ones tasked with making sure public transport ran on time, keeping the education system on track, ensuring that supply chains were functional, etc. Their liberalization of the economy from the years 1960 to 1964 had brought food back into abundance and the economy came roaring back to life. Owing to the spectacular failure of the Great Leap Forward, Mao had been quietly displaced within the party and took a backseat to the pragmatists Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping who had to clean up his mess. He spent the period in partial absentia from party duties but retained a symbolic role. Mao's absence from politics coincided with the quality of life greatly improving for the average person, humiliating him at the hands of his capitalist rota underlings. The question was, who was going to be his Khrushchev? Deng Xiaoping? Liu Xiaoqi? The answer would be both. Both used Khrushchev's speech to attack Mao's cult of personality and went as far as to write Mao Zedong thought out of the party constitution. On January 1962, 7,000 party cadres in Mao convened in Beijing to discuss the disaster that was the Great Leap Forward. Mao Star was at its lowest amongst his Communist Party comrades, who knew that it was his idea and he who had carried it out. The same can't be said for Mao in the public eye though. With the abundance of food available again by 1964, very much owed to the abandoning of the Great Leap Forward communes and embracing more liberal economic policies, Mao's popularity would grow further as he would receive all the credit for revitalizing the nation and bringing it out of destitution, a destitution that he himself had created. Only the party elite had known the truth and become jaded with Mao's antics. 
The years 1960 to 1964 had also been full of impressive achievements for China. China was able to explode its first atomic bomb, France became one of the first Western countries to recognize communist China over Taiwan, and in a cruel twist of ironic fate, Mao's arch nemesis, Khrushchev, that socialist pretender, was ousted, almost as if to prove once and for all who was in the right in the end. Despite hardly being present, Mao was lauded as a genius and a brilliant leader, soaking up all the credit. With Mao riding the high of his success, Mao stepped boldly into action. In order to get out of the famine caused by the Great Leap Forward, parts of the countryside were allowed to be decollectivized. This was an abomination for Mao. Being mostly robbed of direct power, Mao would countermand party decisions using channels of his own creation, thus launching an inner party civil war with his comrades. Mao would begin his assault by going after education. The purpose of his socialist education campaign was to use culture to ultimately get the populace to support the elimination of all activities that take place outside of the planned economy. Mao's most dedicated soldier in this civil war was Minister of Defense Lin Biao, the lapdog replacement of the less compliant Peng Dehuai. Lin Biao, acting as Minister of National Defense, effectively controlled the People's Liberation Army, and it's here where Lin Biao fine-tuned an indoctrination campaign that was first to be used on his own soldiers. The PLA had meticulously formulated, streamlined, and perfected the art of loving Mao down to a science, with the main purpose of exporting this militaristic love of Mao to the Chinese youth. As Mao's socialist education campaign inculcated the youth with the ethic of soldiery, Mao's propaganda took on a more martial tone. Students in schools across the country were taught army drills such as throwing dummy grenades and marching while many children were sent to army boot camps where they would partake in the same battle-tested propaganda the PLA was subjected to. There were two keys to the success of the PLA's indoctrination campaign of its own soldiers, and subsequently the youth who idolized them. The first was the semi-mythical figure known as Lei Feng, whose fictional likeness was used to inspire deep affection for the party. This handsome young man encapsulated the perfect virtues of the perfect soldier, brave, selfless, loyal, and above all, was totally dedicated to the chairman all his life, until his life was tragically cut short at the age of 21. Lei Feng was canonized into sainthood by the PLA who upheld his figure as the perfect role model for the youth, who could more closely relate to him as opposed to the godlike figure of Mao. The second key is the famous Little Red Book. Originally promoted amongst the PLA cadets, this instrument was used so people could indoctrinate themselves even without the supervision of a superior. Containing the quotations of Mao, soldiers would consult with the book for every one of life's decisions, regardless of how mundane. The Red Book had a perfectly religious quality to it. It was the exact words of a divine figure. Its words were irrefutable and came to be considered the most important book to have ever existed by those who lived through such a time. The success of Lin Biao's indoctrination campaign catapulted him into the number two position in China, coming to gain control of the cultural bureaucracy which was fast becoming the most powerful bureau in the nation. With his success politicizing the PLA, he was given permission to turn his finely tuned military propaganda machine to the public, such that every loudspeaker in every corner of the nation would be airing his pre-recorded monologues. The source of Mao's power was culture, and the most receptive vessel was the children. If Mao was to use the children to topple his political enemies and to enact massive cultural change, he had to start out relatively slow, like a man courting a woman. It started out with mostly fun stuff, such as role-playing as soldiers at school, to throwing toy grenades and shooting rifles on school grounds. As children's political education intensified at school, they were blessed with the adult privilege of reading the state-run newspaper, which in time practically became a classroom textbook, whilst at the same time they were also given their very own little red books, just like their comrades in the army. With the children thoroughly primed, they could then be slipped more adult information by their indoctrinated teachers and state-run media, such as how the Soviet Union had betrayed the socialist revolution and how their party was infiltrated by the secret capitalist oppressor Khrushchev. What a terrible tragedy for the children of the Soviet Union, they thought. Because the children were too young and lacked context, the narrative is spelled out clearly for them. Before the children of that era were born, oppressive and evil capitalists had run China and the Soviet Union. These oppressive capitalists were simply inhuman. With no redeemable qualities, they lived solely to spread misery to the slaves who enriched them. 
It was said that the Chinese youth were lucky to be born into the one-fourth of the world who was blessed enough to live under real socialism. Factories in America, meanwhile, were operated by scores of Oliver Twist their own age, worked to death into Keynesian conditions run by cartoonishly villainous capitalists who labored day and night to oppress their people. Please, sir. I want some more. What? 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 Ask for more? To be born during this glorious time was to be born into a lucky era where the people were finally freed from the shackles of their oppression after thousands of years. With children now being let in on the truth that adults had kept from them, they could now be propositioned with a call to action to defend the nation. The evil capitalist oppressors had manifested themselves within the Chinese Communist Party itself and sought to destabilize China's prosperous utopia, they were told. Revisionist, capitalist rooters, counter-revolutionaries, socialist bourgeoisie, they were all the same. The point was that the perfect utopia Mao Zedong himself had carved out from the clutches of these inhuman monsters was now under attack once again from these same forces, except this time it's from within. Will you reject Mao's call to defend everything you hold dear? Soon, school children from the age of four to college students in their mid-twenties all around the country were itching for a fight with real or imagined oppressors. The media was so bombastic in their claims of secretive capitalist conspirators working behind the scenes that tensions amongst the youth were volcanic beneath the surface and was a hair prick away from exploding. Mao's next move would be to seek to gain control on the contemporary culture front. On November 1965, a play was written by venerable historian and powerful party apparatchik Wu Han, whose play, Dismissed from Office, features the upright Ming officer Hai Rei, who was wrongfully dismissed from his post for warning the emperor about his excesses. In China, there's a strong tradition of using historical allusion to voice opposition, with even esoterically coded writings from history being widely understood for their true meanings. And Mao saw this play as a thinly veiled allegory for Peng Dehuai's purge. Mao needed to gain a monopoly on pop culture before his enemies could successfully use the same weapons of culture against him. To do this, Mao enlisted the help of his wife, Shanghai actress Jiang Qin. Being a darling starlet of media pop culture, she was able to impregnate the cultural following trendies with Mao's fanatical political rhetoric. Cosmopolitan Shanghai was a hotbed of communist fanaticism. The city was the epicenter of young bohemian types with relatively well-off parents. Being the city that serves as the focal point of contemporary culture, it's here where the youthful radicals indulge in their ideology, an ideology far flung from the consequences it could produce, and more suited to the fictional plays they watch in the theatres or the books they read. Shanghai was the perfect base for Mao for which to attack his revisionist enemies in the party who resided in Beijing. Jiang Qin, known as Madame Mao, would make her voice known to the world by publicly protesting the play, dismissed from office, as having anti-Mao rhetoric and that the playwright, Wu Han, secretly harbored capitalist elements and sought to overturn the socialist revolution. The party sought to oppose her by refusing to publish her scathing article in the People's Daily, but in the end it was no use. 39 party apparatchiks and the tragic playwright himself were ultimately purged, catapulting Madame Mao into becoming an unparalleled political force. It was now clearer than at any other time for the party comrades that war was afoot. With all the dry powder ready, the fuse to set everything off was lit. In July 1966, Mao had signaled to the world that something big was brewing. He took a swim in the Yangtze, and whilst a fairly innocuous activity, the manner and style of his much publicized swim mirrored one he had done 10 years beforehand at the initiation of the Great Leap Forward. Mao would make clear the premise of his intentions in an anti-Soviet polemic he wrote, of which he used documents and items quoted from the Soviet press to prove once and for all that the proletariat was under attack by the bourgeoisie from within. In the polemic, Mao emphasizes the need to rear revolutionary successes, quote, in the final analysis, the question of training successes for the revolutionary cause of the proletariat is one of whether or not there will be people who can carry on the Marxist-Leninist revolutionary cause started by the older generation of proletarian revolutionaries." Quote. Mao wanted to guarantee that even long after his death, 
The spirit of revolution would never be lost and the only way to secure this legacy is to permanently immunize future generations from the innumerable, shapeless hydra that is the oppressive capitalist bourgeoisie. Regardless of whether they were called capitalist rotors, counter-revolutionaries, social bourgeoisie, capitalist oppressors, they will eternally seek to destroy the proletarian revolution and return the Chinese people into bondage. Whether it was after Mao had died, a generation from now, or a thousand years from now, their subversive influence was like a permanent force of gravity oppressing the masses for all time. So this was to be the final revolution, the revolution to end all revolutions, a fundamental transformation of the mind and spirit that will instill future generations with a revolutionary ethic of their forebears, bringing on an age of endless perpetual revolution, and thus begin the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. Mao circulated a document amongst high-level party officials that ordered them to catch bourgeoisie officials that had hidden themselves amongst their ranks. Many officials in the party were appalled at this directive, but the memory of persecution was still very fresh in their memories during the anti-rightist campaigns. Furthermore, those most likely to be accused of being said capitalist oppressor were those that sat on the sidelines and tried to play it low key. There was clearly one way given to survive this, and that was to make your unholy sacrifice of a scapegoat. The more closer and personal your relationship with that person, the more potent your sacrifice and the greater your rewards. This was a sociopathy that would affect the entirety of society from the power party elite down to the lowliest beggar. Mao avoided direct confrontation with any one particular political rival, instead he riled up resistance against him through radical changes he made, causing his enemies to expose themselves to the pitchfork wielding mob who in their radical devotion to Mao strictly adhered to his order to weed out class enemies. <laughs> It was by this way that no secret police was set up. No KGB, no Stasi unit. There was no spy agency or any need for microphones to be secretly installed in people's bathroom mirrors. The cattle would police themselves, from the party to the commune level. The gasoline would now be poured onto the inflamed passions of the youth and beckon them forth to sweep away the bull demons and snake spirits. A poetically savage epithet that had become a popular term used to denounce any person at any time for any reason. Mao's editorial would proclaim, The climax of the great proletarian cultural revolution is rising in socialist China, which accounts for a quarter of the world's population. It then calls on the proletariat to completely eradicate all the old ideas, old culture, old customs, and old habits that have poisoned the people of China for thousands of years, fostered by the exploiting classes. Mao would then utter the phrase that would have become infamous, to rebel is good.
Thanks a lot for watching guys, stick around for part 2. I may not be around YouTube forever due to the changing conditions of what you can and can't say here, so if you haven't subscribed to me on BitChute, Odyssey or Rumble, you can click the link in the description below and subscribe to me there. Whether you're in China or in the outside world, there are forces attempting to seize the means of people's ability to speak freely. The same people also want the ability to control how you spend your money. That's why I think you need to sign up with WildWest.Exchange. At WildWest.Exchange, you can use Bitcoin to buy and sell any item you want. Use Bitcoin to buy gold, cars, food. And if you want to get Bitcoin to do that, head on over to wildwest.trade and use any payment method from WeChat Pay to PayPal to cash in person exchanges. And if Bitcoin is banned in your country, sign up with ExpressVPN. It's the most battle tested VPN against China's great firewall, therefore making it the best VPN in the world when it comes to protecting yourself and your identity from government surveillance and overcoming restrictions to your internet usage. Thanks again for watching guys, and I'll see you soon.